Masterminds have been around for a long time, right? But unless you had a bunch of extra income to throw at it, you couldn't be a part of it. Well, we wanted to solve that problem. And so we're bringing Masterminds to you for free. Welcome to Mastermind for the Masses. Hey, everyone. Welcome to uh, this week's Mastermind for the Masses. Uh, I'm proud to say we didn't have nearly as many technical difficulties today, so we must be getting better at this, uh, which is good. Uh, or at least I'm getting better at this because I'm the one that usually has the issues. But uh, no, uh, it's been a it's been a good week. Um, you know, turned forty um, and just uh, loving loving life now. I'm thinking about maybe trying my hand at making some hot sauce. Um, so I made up some recipes, and I think I might try making my own little uh, craft hot sauce and see how that goes. So I'll be sure to keep everyone up to date with that. Um, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Shan here to see how his week's going before we dive into the podcast today, which uh, is actually going to be a deep dive on me, like we've done with Colby and Shan in the past. So, Shan, what's up this week, man? Uh, not too much. I got two weeks before I got to be out of here. Um, so I've been starting to pack up everything, um, starting to add all or continue to do all the improvements to the house. Uh, just been focusing on a lot of that. Um, other than that, not too much going on. Nice. Yeah, and on my end, uh, not too much has changed. Um, although we are, uh, my fiance have been looking at houses in the area, um, just cause, um, that was kind of the plan when we initially moved up here was like maybe wait a year or so and then start looking at houses and stuff once we got a better idea of the area. So we started looking around and seeing what we liked and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then outside of that, I still been, um, Learn to program, uh, still doing a bunch of that stuff. I've actually been studying a lot of uh, C language stuff, which has been very interesting for people who aren't aware. C is just one of like the first um, popular languages that came out in like the late 70s. Um, and it's been very useful for helping to sort of understand a lot of the lower level elements that kind of get abstracted away um, in more modern languages. So it's been, uh, it's been difficult, but it's been uh, very interesting to say the least. Uh, yeah, and outside of that, not much. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, excited to follow you guys on your journeys with everything that's going on. But uh, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you all because uh, it's a deep dive on me. So I don't, I'm ready for whatever. All right. Well, I was actually kind of curious, um, mainly because uh, of my own selfish interest is um, so because like, I guess I'm at the point in, you know, my career where you know, I've already been through, uh, you know, a couple, a couple of companies outside of college, you know, been in the workforce for coming up on what would be like seven ish years. Yeah. Something like that. Six or seven. And, um, you know, when you kind of go out of college, you're like, you're really not sure what you're going to do for a lot of people. You kind of throw some stuff against the wall. You see what sticks. And, you know, I think kind of like now is at the point where you kind of have like maybe like a rough idea of what you expect the future to be like. And I'm kind of at that point, but I'm curious from your perspective, Josh is, did you have a moment in your life where you felt like you knew where you were going around this sort of like time period, like in your mid mid twenties. And then how did like reflecting on that, how did it actually end up? Like how far removed was the actual result from what you thought was going to be the case? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know if I still even know what I'm going to wind up doing, you know, one day, if, I, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, one of the verses I love is, you know, a man makes his plans, but uh, the Lord guides his steps. And so um, even if when I make plans, things, things happen. Uh, if you were to have asked me 20 years ago if I thought I'd be where I am today, I, I definitely wouldn't have. Um, so I think for me, it was just... For me, it's really been priority driven, um, you know, what's most important in my life and decisions that I've made around that, including my career, have all been driven by that, right? So is this going to provide a better uh, life for my family? Is it going to keep my work-life balance in check as much as possible? Um, you know, and do I enjoy what I'm doing? Because life's pretty short. So I think over time, I just... I, I got into IT accidentally, um, or at least not planned. Right? I think I've shared before that I went in the Marine Corps open contract. They picked my job for me. When I was getting out, my ex-wife was eight months pregnant with our second child, and I was the sole uh, 
financial source. So I kind of stuck with that and went into the Nielsen company for a little bit of time. Um, and then after that, uh, went into the school system. And that was really heavily driven by, like I said, the priorities and being able to have that work-life balance because Nielsen was a great company, but a very challenging schedule to plan for. Um, stayed with the school system. And when that no longer was the best benefit for the family, I decided to move on to what I'm doing now with uh, IT and construction. So, um, and, you know, obviously along the way, I've discovered that what I really enjoy about what I do every day is helping people and being able to help with provide solutions to problems. And that's why I think I, I continue to do things like this, right? This is where my passion ultimately leads to, of course, into um, providing value for others and providing value wherever I can. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I've done the different things um, because it's just, for me, that's, that's kind of the driving force is how can I use the time I have to make the world a better place as cheesy as it sounds, right? No, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess it's like a quick follow up. So I mean, it, so it kind of sounds like you didn't really it was more about get achieving like the goal of like having what would be the best for your sort of your life as a whole in terms of work life balance, you know, income wise, all that sort of stuff, right? Which is just very curious to me, because I like, I know, like, that's definitely something that is that I focus on, but I've never really like made it my primary thing that I thought about. And I guess it's just, it's interesting to a uh, way to approach it. Cause, cause like from, from my perspective, it's always been like, think about the type of work you want to do and then figure out how to achieve those other items afterwards. But it seems like that was never really a specific focus. Is that true or? Yeah. Cause you know, there's that old question, right. And it's probably not enough anymore, but they used to say, you know, if you won a million dollars, right. Or you won the lotto, what would you do for work? And that's what you should do. I probably wouldn't do anything. I mean, if I had unlimited funds, I, I'd travel a lot and I'd sit around and, you know, go to fancy restaurants or whatever, but no one's paying me to do that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I think for me, it really is what's the outcome that I want and how do I best achieve that? And so that that's more of the lens I take at it as opposed to this is the field I want to be in or this is because, you know, although I've been in IT, I've been in IT in a lot of different areas, food service, construction, school systems, um, you know, so the, the industry changed, I guess, but the application of my skill set didn't necessarily change. Um, but what drove me was really what's just going to create the best life that I can have. Because for me, also the way I look at it is work is, you know, eight hours a day or 40 hours a week, sometimes more, of course. Um, but, uh, it's only a portion of the whole picture. So I want to make sure the whole picture is, is what I want it to be. And sometimes that does mean aligning your career with, with things to make you happy, uh, which I totally understand. If I was miserable and hated IT, I wouldn't stay in IT, which I'm, I'm not obviously. Um, but I don't think I ever had a moment where I said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take this step to become this role in this, in this industry. It, it was more, this is what I want for my life. And does this move me closer to my goal or farther away? And, and that kind of guided me through my career progression, I would say. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Jen, did you have something? Yeah, yeah, I got a quick question. Again, this one's like, just like Colby out of my own curiosity. So at one, what point, and we'll bring it back to the military, right? Um, at what point did you feel a sense of you locking in? And what I mean by locking in that, um your ambitions starting to build from that moment on right like maybe you've yeah. always been ambitious but what point did you walk in and decide that okay i'm not going to stop until i finish this and then when i finish that i'm going to continue and do this kind of like build up your mindset to kind of what it is today mm -hmm. um and if you could like maybe start around like the military time because you know yeah. a lot of people join um to try to build that drive or build that um that ambition and uh you know a lot of people leave the military and they kind of feel lost in a sense yeah. so did, did you have that driven mentality before and if not um how did you gain it afterwards yeah so i i think i was always a big dreamer but i can tell you i definitely was a procrastinator 
as well. Uh, I think we joked about on a different podcast with uh, Chad Jones, right? Uh, that he knew me in high school and that's what he actually wrote in my, uh, my yearbook is don't procrastinate. <laughs> um, and ironically, I think I wound up going in the Marine Corps because I, I did have a lack of direction or a lack of, um, you know, what am I going to actually do? So I went in there. That's why I went in open contract. They picked the career of IT for me. Um, and I, I was, think I was fine, kind of coasting along. I, I didn't really have necessarily massive aspirations other than just dreaming of, you know, yeah, whatever you dream of in your 20s of, oh, yeah, I'll probably become an actor or, you know, something right. along those lines. Um, but then, yeah, after a little bit, when I decided to join the military, I realized, you know, hey, here's something I can do. Uh, it has structure built into it, which is nice. But I'll be honest, even then, I was still kind of just floating along. The the moment that I would say really was the catalyst in my life, and, and they know this is when my kids came along, right? Which is why I continue to talk about family being my driving force. When my daughter, when I found out I was going to be a father, it was, um, you know, I was 20 years old, and uh, I, I was married, and uh, I, she actually was born at 21. But when I found out, I think I went and enrolled in college courses that day, if not that day, definitely that week. Um, not that college is a requirement or anything, but I knew at some point, I, I pretty much knew at that point that I was going to get out of the military. Um, because when I went in, you know, yes, I had family and things, but I didn't have anyone necessarily directly depending on me, um, especially not for the next 18 years. Right. So, and beyond, uh, but I think when she came along and I realized that I was going to be a father and I was going to be the direct responsible party to provide a life for someone else. Um, that's really when I was like, okay, well, I should probably get my act together um, and start actually working on building a life rather than coasting along. So that's when I actively started to go back to school. I was actually able to get my AA before I got out of the military um, then I moved out into Nielsen. That schedule, like I said, was just really difficult. I didn't know when I was working tomorrow till 10 o'clock tonight. So it made even trying to go back to school or doing anything else or just having family time be difficult. There were days when I didn't see my son awake. Um, so did that for a period of time because sometimes you have to do what you have to do. But then I had an opportunity to open up at the, the school system. Um, and I was fortunate enough that that schedule was pretty concrete. You know, it was nice. You got some decent holidays out of it as well, because you've got the winter break and spring break. I started to work summers, but they went to four day weeks that definitely created a lot more flexibility for me to go and continue to pursue aspirations. So that's when I, I uh, got my bachelor's and my master's and my doctorate. And I had a couple of businesses in there as well. Um, especially when I, would say I was earlier in my career um, when I needed to supplement finance. So I started Nelson Computer Services and, you know, that became so profitable that I either had to uh, exit that or, um, you know, quit my day job. So wound up exiting that and then I started a, uh, a leadership development company and have been kind of in that world ever since. So, um I, I guess my main driving force to answer your question was kind of uh, my family and my daughter specifically is what kicked that off. That do you, uh, as a follow-up to that, do you find as, because how, how old is your youngest kid now? My youngest is 11. Uh, okay. My oldest went off to college this year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so is that something you've thought about where, you know, once all the kids are out of the house, you know, do you think, like, is it so ingrained in you now, like that sort of motivation that it's kind of hard to get rid of at that point? Or do you think it will get harder as, you know, the kids leave and life is less, you know, people are depending on you less yeah. and less in your personal life that that'll become a harder thing? So I, I don't think it's, again, I don't think I ever had the lack of motivation or the lack of the desire or the dream, right? What I think I lacked was the focus to actually make it happen. Um, initially, I was more of a drifter. And now I do think that it's just been so long of me seeing an issue, figuring out how to solve it, knowing what it takes to get over it or get through it. Um, 
or work within the confines of it, right? That I, I don't think it's going to be as challenging. I think I needed that boost to get myself going, but now I'm, to your point, it's almost muscle memory at this point. I'd have to actively, I'd have to go in reverse. I'd have to actively not want to do anything anymore uh, and make that conscious decision. And I, I just don't foresee that in the future. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of what I figured, to be honest, is, I mean, it's like you do something for that long with that level in, of intensity over time, like it's just bound to become who you are as a person. Um, yeah, and I think I'll always be a little bit of a, a hobbyist, if nothing else, right? Even if I don't always open up a new business or anything, it, it's a, a very, very minimum. I'll, I think I'll always find something new to keep myself entertained. Like I said today uh, in the intro, looking at doing hot sauce now yeah <laughs> um i was curious um you know obviously you've had like a pretty decently long career now uh doing very a variety of different things has there ever been one person or maybe a couple people where they were actually very helpful mentors within your professional life or is that not something you came across during your professional times? Is this kind of something you just learned as you go? You never really had like a more formal mentor or someone who you like began to model, I, I guess, like your professional decisions off of, or, you know, influence you in some sort of way. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I can tell you the only person I've ever worked with that I would have considered in that mentor capacity um, was probably, um, maybe got involved maybe 10 years ago and, and kind of served that role for four or five years. Um, his name was Craig, uh, Coyle and, and, uh, he definitely took the time and invested in me. I know Shan also, uh, has a relationship with him as well. And, uh, you know, he's probably the first person that ever really took the time to, invest in that capacity. I mean, there were definitely leaders along that way that helped me. And I, I don't feel like I didn't, couldn't find support when I needed it, but as someone that actively like pursued that mentor mentee type of relationship, I think I would say he was the one that was probably the most impactful throughout that journey. Now that being said, um, you know, I was 30, you know, 20, yeah, the, around 30, 29, 30, before that relationship formed. So um, for a lot of that time in the earlier years of my career, I think it was just trial and error and trying to learn from the outside rather than any kind of direct mentor relationship. Like there's books, there's videos, there's even back then, right? I mean, it wasn't as prevalent to hop on YouTube or anything like that, but there's definitely ways you can learn. Um, and glean information, even if you don't have direct mentorship from somebody. That makes sense. Sorry, Shannon, I don't want to hog everything. I'll let you no, go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. Um, I did have a question. Um, so you, you're one of the more positive people I know. You know. You're generally always positive. In fact, it's really hard to catch you kind of in a bad mood, or at least you're really good at faking it. Um, so my question to you is, have, one, have you always been like that? Two, um, if you have it, how did you kind of build that persona? And I guess um, as a follow-up to question, a follow-up question to that is, not only how did you build that persona, but what do you do when you do face, um, you know, moments of hardship or, or you know, depressive thoughts or, or anything like that? I think that's a uh, that's probably the biggest part that shines in your personality, and a lot of people could really, you know, um, get some uh, good outlook to, you know, that kind of question or that kind of answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess it's all in how you look at it for, for me, right? I, I used to struggle with this optimism versus pessimism and realism. And I think realism ultimately is just how you, everybody's a realist. It's just what how how do you look at it right what's your reality and and how do you look at the the way things are framed and for me it wasn't it wasn't a natural optimist uh type of thing that i had in fact i can be a, i can be relatively negative in my head um for sure uh you know on the myers brig element i'm an entj and that j stands for judging so i mean i'm constantly thinking about 
the way things are and the way they could be or should be. Um, so it's not that I don't necessarily see the challenges that are there. I think it's the frame and the perspective of how I try to view those things. Um, and I can give you one, one example, right? I mean, if I, if I take it back to the military, you know, there were times where bullets were flying over the head and things like that. And that's not happening. <laughs> you know, I mean, worst case scenario, um, you know, I mean, really, if I got boiled down to the worst thing that could happen in my career is I, I got fired, right? And there'll be another job somewhere. You know, hopefully that doesn't happen. I'm just saying in general, that's really kind of the worst case scenario. I'm still going to be breathing. I'm still going to have my family. I'm still going to, you know, pick up and, and figure something out the next day. Um, so that helps me keep a, a decent perspective um you know but again in, in true reality there are plenty of times when i'm not in the best mood um or not necessarily the most optimistic but i also feel i, I guess i try to put it into context and look around at everything going on and things could always be worse um you know, and I do have, I, I guess I count my blessings more than my shortcomings is what keeps me in a, in a positive mood. Because even on the worst day, I can look around and I mean, let's be honest, right? I've got oxygen and I've got food, probably. I, I've never really had a day where I didn't, wasn't able to get food or, or, you know, water or all the necessities that I need in life. Maybe I don't have all the wants, um, but I don't, I don't think anyone ever will, even if you had unlimited funds there's it's just our natural human instinct that there's going to be something else right there's always going to be something so i i guess for me i always try to be content without being complacent and that contentment allows me to just be okay with whatever's going on and and the other flip side of that is as i've said i make all my decisions based off of the priorities in my life um and so whatever happens with the outcomes of those because my priorities are set as the first factor i'm always okay with it because the most important thing is protected and taken care of whereas anything ancillary if it happens it happens i would like to add to this because i i do i completely understand where you're coming from shan with this question because it's absolutely one of josh's like biggest like traits about him especially with working with him and I've, I'm curious to think, like, or I'm curious to know what you think about this, Josh, because from my understanding, too, because I've seen the side of you that isn't, like, positive, right? Like, I've seen those sides of you where you get, like, upset about something or whatever, and I'm like, man, this guy's an actual person. Like, he is not, like, above reality or above, you know, experiencing, you know, frustration, all those sorts of things. And um, what I kind of realized, and you you said this, too, was um, was, like, when you're – a leader, you should never be complaining downwards. You shouldn't complain. You can complain at the even level. You can complain up, but you should never be complaining like downwards to the people who are working for you. And um, mm -hmm. I think, at least for me, um, that really resonated with me quite a bit because the whole idea is that you don't. You want to create an environment. You want to create a feeling of positivity of enjoyment like people they don't want to feel negative when they're working for you you want them to you know feel feel good you want to feel you want them to enjoy being there and part of that is cultivating an environment where people you know have that optimistic view on things like hey how do we solve the problem now how do we dwell on the problem those sorts of things right it's not like you're trying to like sort of gaslight people into thinking that problems don't exist the idea is that like we well there is a problem regardless what's the best way to approach the problem not like just mm -hmm. be annoyed that there is one right and i'm curious to know like do you think like that's is, is that something that you think contributes to this like me and shan's perception of you being such an optimistic person because like i'm curious like if you feel like in your personal life or like if everything else like outside of your leadership roles where you feel like you're actually just um you know a pretty normal person yeah, I mean, normal subjective, uh, but definitely, I, I I try to just, I, I think you've got two ways to work through life. You can be, you know, you can be upset and kind of miserable about things, but really all that does is 
create misery <laughs> in your in your own life, right? Um, or you can look at the positive and try to um, enjoy life. And I definitely do try to take the enjoy side of life. Now, you're absolutely right. Um, in a leadership role, you know, you do have to sometimes uh, paint the rosy picture or at least try to get everyone to understand the challenge that's before us. And, you know, what do you want to focus on as a team or as a leader or is it, and as an individual? Do you want to focus on the things that you can't control that suck because you can't control them anyway? Or do you want to focus on the things that you can control? And, you know, at that point, if you can control them and they suck, fix it. And if you can't control them, then, I mean, it is what it is, right? Like me being frustrated or upset or annoyed about it. Yes, it's a natural human response. It definitely happens to me. There are times when I'm just like, oh my gosh, dude, this again or whatever. But it's usually short-lived um, because of that. I, I, and, and to your, your, one of your questions there is, you know, how do I kind of turn it around if I start to go down that rabbit hole? Again, it's, it's just looking around at what positives there are. And I try to rewrite the narrative in my head because one of the things we definitely do as, as humans is come up with an idea and we tell ourselves that idea over and over and over again. And we build upon it and we're like, oh man, this thing really, someone cut me off in traffic. So I'm initially mad, right? And then I'm like, man, I can't believe that guy cut me off in traffic and he's driving in front of me for a while. So I'm constantly staring at his car and I'd be like, man, I wish I could just pull in front of him and, you know, do all this stuff. And, you know, so that's one option. I can get all upset, heated, and, and stay in that upset moment. Or I can stop for a second and say, hey, maybe he's rushing home because he got a call that, you know, someone had an accident. Uh, maybe he's late for work and he's just trying to make sure that he doesn't get fired today, right? Um, and Because and, I don't know what that guy's or girl is going through that just cut me off in traffic. There might be a reason that I would have done the exact same thing. And so I kind of put myself in their shoes for a minute. Um, and then I start to reframe that narrative because now I'm telling myself over and over again, okay, you should give them some grace. You know, maybe there's a reason that they had to do something. Um, you know, it's like when you get stuck in traffic and you're upset and then you get up to why, why you've been in standstill traffic for two hours and it's a car accident and you're like, well, shoot, at least I wasn't in a car accident today. Yeah. I mean, I had to get two hours, but I don't have to go deal with finding a new car, possible hospital injuries, you know, even a death. Like, none of that is a problem for me. So why am I mad that I got stuck in traffic for a couple hours? Yeah, it sucked. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm not going to remember that traffic jam in 10 years. I would remember if, you know, I lost a leg in a car accident, you know. So I guess it's weights and measures and just trying to decide how you're going to look at things and how you're going to frame them. And, it, and it's a muscle. Um, you know, it's definitely come to be more natural over the years. I, I can see things a little bit faster. I don't necessarily dwell on the negative as long. Um, but I guess that's my approach is to count your blessings. <laughs> yeah, that all makes sense. Did you have a follow-up, Shan? Uh, just one more quick one um, from my end. Uh, so everyone kind of faces like some kind of wear of hardship, right? Like we all go through it. And that's one thing uh i'm going to bring up after we talk about like your positive outlook on a lot of things of course you have gone through hardship gone through deep things tough things uh, you mentioned like earlier like you know you could lose your job in a situation like that um where it kind of just for most people naturally puts them in the position where they're like my life is over um how do you handle those um short term right yeah. so for me like i've learned literally like I've learned in the past like 10 years that um, hardship's almost like a secret weapon, right? Like it's, a, it's an opportunity for two paths. Either you can go on the path of decline, which I don't th feel like a lot of people do, or you have a new path that wasn't even open before of uh, pursuing excellence, right? Like let's say you do lose a job. Um, a lot of people, you know, it, it breaks them, but other people, it, it motivates them to try harder, uh, search harder, train harder, and then they end up in a better position than they were. So how, how have you dealt with that one in your earlier years? And what is your mindset to it now? Yeah, uh, I mean, definitely I can think of the fact that I, I guess I always go back to at some point, 
everyone who's ever done anything great started in the same position. And, you know, in, at some point I didn't have a job. I didn't have, uh, you know, a, a family. I didn't have a lot of different things. Um, and I kind of built that up over time. Uh, so when those bad things do occur and maybe you lose a portion of that, um, you know, cause to your point, I have gone through some, some challenging things. Um, and when those types of things occur, you can, like you said, kind of dwell on them and head down that negative path, or you can look around and say, okay, what are the opportunities that this provides? Um, and, and how do I get back to where I want to be or, you know, take that new direction. But the difference now is I, if I were to say lose a role now, um, you know, I had no career 20 plus years ago. I have 20 plus years of experience, knowledge, uh, perspective that I didn't have then. And that allows me to expedite things and um, be able to kind of achieve that success a little bit faster because I don't get hung up on the roadblocks and the required learning that it would have taken the first go round. Right. Like I already understand things. It's like, anything that you do right if you've changed a tire before the first time you changed it you were probably like i don't know did i do this right am i you know where do i put this car jack that type of thing but after you've done it 10 times 15 times 100 times whatever it is it's almost like second nature you can have a conversation you're not really thinking about it because you've got the skills the expertise and and the practice and i think that's that allows you to rebound a lot faster. And if you can leverage those skills as uh, along with the relationships that you have along the way too, I've got 20 plus years of relationships that I've built um, that I can lean on if something were to happen, right? That would be more negative. So collectively, I think um, you're just able to bounce back a lot quicker as you get older from some of these things that happen in life because you've lived through challenges before you know it's not the end and um you know you can find that strength internally to move forward because you've done it time and time again throughout your life yeah yeah that's one thing that like if i could go back and tell my younger self something it, it'd be like hey when this like really crappy thing happens get excited about it because like that i mean your example of like the car right like i don't think anyone would have aspirations to do motor work or figure out, um, you know, how to, I don't know, change spark plugs on your car or something like that, unless something actually happened to the car, right? Like that ends up being a drive, like a driving factor to learning the skill set and taking care of it yourself. So that would be something that like, if I could tell my, my younger self, hey, when, when crap hits the fan, like get excited about it. And I know that sounds crazy, but um, just that little bit, just that sentence could, you know, help, um, elevate that rebound that you're talking about so what's one thing that you would uh go and tell maybe your your 18 year old self if you could yeah it's funny my son just just asked me this question too um i would say if i was going to tell my 18 year old self anything i'd say you know humble yourself don't don't uh don't feel this need to do it on your own or prove yourself or whatever, because at the end of the day, none of that happens anyway. You know, you hear these stories of self-made millionaires. There's no such thing. Um, they had help along the way. They had people that definitely stepped up for them. Um, you know, there's no self-made person. You know, there might be people that had more trials, maybe less help, but at the end of the day, there's nobody that's gotten to wherever they are completely by themselves. Um, and, and I think, we spend so much time getting in our own way when someone does want to help us lend a hand, set us up for success um, because of a pride issue, right? Like, oh, I can do it on my own. Yeah, you can, but you don't have to because you've got uh, a group of people around you that want to support you and um, see you succeed. So why would you turn that away? You know, and I think that's probably what I would tell my younger self who really felt like, he needed to prove himself to the world, right? Um, I mean, that's why I did a lot of the stuff I've done. And when I was younger, I felt this need to like validate my existence, if you will. And, and you know, that was done the day I was born. I'm, I'm here, um, 
but there was this this natural desire. That's why I went for the doctor. That's why I went for the Marine Corps. That's why I've done went to the marathon, skydive, wrote, all these things that I do. Right? It was because I needed to check some sort of proverbial box, um, and I would tell myself to not focus on that so much and just enjoy the ride, right? Because you're going to find things along the way and let people help you um, and be a success. And I think at times I was smart enough to do that when I was younger, but when there were times when I wasn't. Perfect example of when I was smart enough, thankfully, Shan was uh, your mom letting me know about the job in the in the school system. Uh, she kind of helped me know what tools were there and really set me up for success in the interview, right? Software I'd never heard of. I was able to research and then look like I was a pretty smart guy uh, during the interview. And that helped a lot. But if I would have been like, oh, no, I don't need any help. I'll do this interview. Who knows? I, I might not have gotten that job and, um, you know, wouldn't be where I am today. That's a good point. It's a good point when you see uh, a lot of professional boxers, fighters, CEOs talking about like the success of their company. Um, someone winning, right? Like usually that post interview, it's usually um, all the same thing. It's like if it wasn't for my team, if it wasn't for my coaches, if it wasn't for my my, my company's um, support system, like this would have never been possible. And I think we hear that a lot, and we hear it so much that we forget about the impact of it. But yeah. reality, yeah, I, I truly believe the people you, start, you surround yourself around um, has a lot to do with your personal outcomes in life it takes a village for sure yeah 100 yeah. percent. uh i guess in a similar vein i was curious um you know throughout your life um especially like once you could sort of begun your career outside of uh you know friends family a lot of that stuff right i'm not gonna let uh, force you to uh to consider that element of things what is your like proudest achievement or proudest thing you've done in your life and what would be your biggest learning? You know, one of the things I love that I did, even though I totally didn't get anywhere with it is I applied to be a uh, astronaut with NASA and mm -hmm. I have my rejection letter at home and I love it. I, you know, because it shows that even because I didn't apply for that until I was probably in my thirties. Right. Um, but even in my thirties, I wasn't ready to not take risks and not push the envelope and, and still try to do something new and exciting. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's probably what I'm most proud of is just the fact that I am someone that typically asks more of how can we rather than can we, right. Uh, I'm reading a book right now and he calls it the now, not how. Um, so get started, right? And and if you have an interest in something, pick it up. I mean, I picked up stained glass because I was walking down Hobby Lobby aisle one day and saw a bunch of it. And I was like, that seems like something kind of cool. So I bought or picked up a book that they had in the thing of what you need to get started. And then I just grabbed all the stuff off the shelf, went home and made a little star, right? And, um, out of stained glass. And I didn't put tons and thought and effort into it. I wasn't expecting to become like somebody that, that uh, was a stained glass expert by any stretch of the imagination, but it was an interest I had. And I just fulfilled that desire to look at it rather than overthink it, analyze it. You know, last time I made stained glass was probably four years ago at best. Um, so it's not like it's even a skill that I use regularly, but I, I guess I'm just proud that I don't let fear stop me from taking risks because one of the things I read many years ago is as you become more successful along the way and you get more that you could lose, you get more risk adverse. And so you stop doing the thing that led to your success. You stop taking the risks that got you to where you are. And I'm proud that I don't feel like I've stopped taking those risks because if i stop taking those risks then the exponential growth that comes from it would also be lost so i guess that would be my proudest thing is that i've been able to maintain a hunger a willingness and 
um, you know, the ability to take action and, and actually see what comes of that. I mean, hell, this year we started a podcast, guys. I mean, like, none of us have podcast experience before this, uh, in case that's not evident to our listeners. But, uh, you know, we thought it, we talked about it, and we did it. Like, we didn't, we didn't let the fear of the unknown, the fear of what would happen, um, stop us. We just took the risk, and now we're and dove right in, right? So this is kind of a long-winded answer, but I think that's probably what I'm most proud of if you exclude friends, family, et cetera. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, did you have anything else, Jan? No, that that uh, that was a a good um, – that long-winded answer was actually, you know, pretty solid and, and honestly has me reflecting on a lot of that because you really don't appreciate – um, the opportunities that you do take until you can reflect on them, right? Like you never appreciate them in the moment. You never pat yourself on the back for starting a podcast in the moment, but you know, a year or six months go by, that's yeah. when things matter. So I, I get your point. Like that's your, your proudest moment and proudest ability is, is to completely junk out fear and not get in your own head. Well, yeah. Yeah, I want to add on that for a second. I, it's not that the fear is not there, don't get me wrong, but the ability that I can find the courage to still move forward in the face of fear, right? Um, I, I used to say Superman is probably like the least brave superhero that there is, right? And, yeah. and follow me on this because he's got no weakness. His one weakness is a rock that hurled through space and maybe is somewhere lodged in Earth, which don't even get me started on how much of that rock somehow funneled its way to earth i know it's a car cartoon and a comic and whatever but i'm just saying like he's got nothing to be afraid of if i was bulletproof could fly had laser vision and incredible strength i'd probably be a superhero too there's really no risk in it I'd probably <laughs> right? be depressed to be honest i mean yeah like that's the thing so the having the courage in the face of adversity i think is is really a, a key to the that avoiding that risk aversion <laughs> People. right so, yeah. no i appreciate it guys um i know we're at kind of time here to wrap things up so i mean i guess final thoughts for me would just be yeah take the risk you know do what do what makes you happy as long as it doesn't impact your priorities in life negatively um you know surround yourself with great people like colby and shan here that you know are willing to take the risk with you and, and kick off a pod or do whatever other element that you might want to do um, you know, and last but not least, I would say my other final thought is, you know, share the pod with your friends, uh, be brave enough to take that step. Uh, and you know, you're going to want to be back next week to also hear about how my hot sauce turns out, hopefully. Um, so that's kind of my final thoughts. Share this with your friends. Um, uh, Colby, any final thoughts, sir? Uh, yeah, I would just say final thoughts for me is uh, it's just a lot of fun hearing both your guys' stories and uh, sort of like more in-depth backgrounds because people don't know, like, I don't think Shan, Josh, or I have really ever had this sort of discussion even with each other outside of the podcast. Like, I, I knew some elements of Josh's, uh, you know, life prior to me working with him. Um, you know, me and Shan have talked a little bit, but like, we've never gotten this in-depth before. And so it was a lot of fun getting to know each of you a lot, a lot more, but I also just... I always just love hearing about people's lives, what they value, how they come to certain conclusions, the choices that they make, et cetera. Cause it's just so eye opening for, I guess, how similar and yet how different everyone is. Right. Because there are certain things that just resonate so much with my own experience. And there's certain things where it's like, wow, yeah, I really do approach doing this thing or doing this element of my life in a completely different way. And that's fine, but it's, it's so awesome to have, the different perspective because it sort of reminds you that you're choosing a way of going about things. It's not the way it's whatever, you know, sort of way that you just chose. And there's always an option of changing that if you want to. Um, so yeah, no, it was just, it's really interesting. I appreciate, you know, you guys um, sharing everything and uh, yeah, I just thought it was really valuable. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback off of that because honestly, before doing these sessions with, um, uh, with all three of us, I really, I don't think I've ever reflected back so much. Um, just because we, before we started this, you know, I figured we had some things in common, but we actually have a lot in common. And I think most people have a lot in common, but they don't get an opportunity to do a 40 minute deep dive 
uh, with each other the way we just did. Um, so what's really important about the aspect of that is being able to kind of reflect and, and think back to when you might have been in a familiar situation and how you handled it or how you, know, you may have not have handled it well. And just kind of, I don't know, uh, grab that kind of emotion and um, reflection on that and, you know, not necessarily compare it to the way maybe Colby or Josh has um, gone through that kind of incident, but it just allows you to really understand um, why you may have thought the way you thought or what action you took, um, like why it was specific at the time. That's been my favorite part about doing these, um, these little deep dives because seeing how, you know, Josh's mindset was maybe um, before he got started and before he was so ambitious and Colby seeing and you know how complex your thoughts get um and and how everything kind of started for you too as well Le leaves me at a, a point where I'm just like constantly reflecting and thinking about how I can try to take a lot of that advice and make it more in the moment because that's where I feel like I am in life now where I have enough um, perception to at least like try to make live um decisions and actions based on it but i'm still always there's you know there's way more i can learn um from hearing about like the past of others so that's really my final thoughts i really liked these sessions yeah no life's life's a journey and it's been good to you know have you guys uh, alongside me as we go through that portion and and this part of uh our journey together with this podcast and everything um you know and you know, looking forward to the next one. So we will see you all next time on Mastermind for the Masses. Thanks, everyone.